So the topic of my ah okay, Kolya, skamandu iki kada. I started recording. Okay, good. So the topic of my today's talk would be infinite symmetries and on shell supersymmetry by BV. So one of the reason to study BV was symmetries. So let me try to explain how people understand symmetries in BV language. So suppose you have an action. For me, it is a function of X. Then suppose you have a vector field V of X such that LV S equal to zero. Suppose you have many vector fields. I put here A. Moreover, suppose that these vector fields form a Lie algebra. This is equivalent to Lie bracket. equals to F A B E V E. And this F form a structure constant of Lie algebras. So it turns out that statements one and two could be rewritten in BV language. Now I need to answer the question. Why should we rewrite the notion of the symmetry in the BV language. And there is an answer. And answer is that if we make BV integration, we will get a new realization of symmetries. And it will turn out that these equations would be modified and modified in the interesting way. And I will give the finite dimensional example of it. The structure that would come out would be called infinity representation of the Lie algebra. And as far as I understand, nobody studied them properly. However, I need to talk to mathematicians. At least they are not popular. And after I'll explain this, I'll come to the more, to the subject that is more interesting for physicists, namely representations of supersymmetry that physicists like a lot. And it will turn out that supersymmetry is uh, represented in the infinity way. Ah, uh, I see the board is out of focus again. Now it's in the focus. Uh, and uh, we will see that this infinity representation actually means that supersymmetry is closed on shell. So you see, there were different group of people. What, there are one people who were doing BV. There are another people who were doing uh, supersymmetry. Moreover, they were in the same institute in Russia and Moscow, in the Lebedev Institute. And not only in the same institute, but uh, in the same uh, theory group. But they did not understand each other. So what I'll explain right now would be kind of a bridge. And uh, finally, I'll show how the maximal uh, supersymmetric theory that doesn't contain gravity could be described in this way and uh, how supersymmetry is realized. Of course, it's real. it will be realized in the infinity way, okay? So this is basically a plan of what I'm going to explain right now. So 
one two is how we understand symmetry now we will re rewrite the same thing in the bb language so we will consider s tilde that, that will depend on x i x star i so here i am using with respect to Batalian and Velkovsky, the notations. C, A, C star A. So in notations that mathematicians like, mathematicians never write X star I. Mathematicians prefer to write theta I. However, in the physical audience, I prefer to use the notations uh, that were put forward by Battalion, just to show some respect to him. He calls these X star I anti fields. And mathematicians were calling this theta I uh, linear coordinates on the cotangent bundle uh, with the inverse parity. But these are exactly the same. Similar thing happens here. This C are, would be odd coordinates on uh, Lie algebra. And this star would be even coordinates on dual. And when I'll come to supersymmetry, of course, parity would change. So after all these preliminaries, I will write the following BV action. S of X, no X star. Then XI star CA VA I of X. And then I will write the third term, one half C star E F A B E C A C B. So from the point of view of the BV language, this is just a sum of a function, no stars, and a special vector field because it has one star coordinate here. And of course, conditions of this thing solves BV equation, as you may see. Is exactly condition one and two. How one is checked? I have this action. Actually, from the pairing of X star and S, I get condition one. Now, there is a term at contains X star. It is commutator of these two vector fields together with the square of this vector field with itself. Commutator of these vector fields gives this. Commutator of C vector field with the so-called matter vector field because of this pairing gives this and the last thing is the square of this vector field and this is the uh, jacobi identity so you see many concepts come together in writing a single expression
Now, one way thing. Why do we use vector fields here? From the BV philosophy, you can write any polyvector. So let me add uh, some very specific term. Xi star, Xj star. So this would be by vector that I will call pi to, for to respect Poisson. And let me take it in the form like this. You may ask why I'm putting two C's here. In some sense, uh, I may answer that it is just to keep the proper parity of the expression. Actually, I will write it in this form because it's exactly the structure that uh, appears in, the, in examples. And I'll keep this term too. So then we may ask, what are the condition that these extended action looks crazy from the standard point of view, however, very natural from BV point of view. That this extended thing uh, solves BV equation. The first condition is the same. The action should be invariant with respect to the vector fields. It is this pairing. And the result of this pairing is, of course, x star independent. It's a function. However, interesting thing happens with equation two. It will be written in the following way. Va, Vb minus Fa, Bc as before. Vc would be equal, not zero. So this commutator, in particular this commutator, is of course a vector field that depends on two C's. So I actually take this type of contraction or this type of contraction. When I say contraction, of course I mean Poisson bracket and in Poisson bracket, uh, you're computing it using contractions. But now there is another way to get corresponding term. And here we need to take a Poisson bracket between this and this. So between vectors, it's a vector. Between by vector, and the function, it's also a vector. And it also is quadratic in C. So I come to some surprising expression. Maybe it's better to write it like this. Poisson bracket between S and this term considered as a by vector. Or in coordinates ds over dx i. So here I of course have C A C B D S over D X I Pi I J 
A, B, C, A, C, B. Now I can cancel this C, A, C, B out. And I have this expression. So what does it mean? It means that the Hamiltonian flow generated by S considered as a Hamiltonian appears in the right hand side. Moreover, this pi actually depends on two indices, A and B. Now let me look at this object from two sides. Would I be a physicist? I would say that it means that the vector field commute as they should according to the Lie algebra and the commutator is not zero. It is proportional to derivative of S. And these things are called by physicists equations of motion. Huh? And uh, they are not just proportional to equations of motion as physicists used to write. There is very special coefficient saying how they are proportional. Okay. Moreover, this pi AB, this by vector, should satisfy additional consistency condition. That is coming from this pairing and from pairing with itself. Okay? So now it is a very interesting structure. In particular, if you consider pairing with itself, you need to say that pi AB for each pair of AB should be a Poissonian structure. Okay, so it's very, so these are very interesting conditions. And it's exactly what we experimentally get from uh, supersymmetric theory. The only question is, how does this structure come out? What is the origin of this structure? Okay, and of course, one question is, is how this structure comes out, and the second question is very practical. So when I explained it to Chinese audience, I wrote it as an instruction, and it was an instruction how to write paper. Not only one set of papers. You take supersymmetric theory with uh, a lot of supersymmetries where you have this closure. It could be gauge theory in uh, dimension uh, four with n equals two supersymmetry. It could be higher supersymmetric theory. It could be supergravity. It could be whatever you wish, where you have this closure. And whenever you have this closure, you are looking for the field pi. You can determine it experimentally and write a paper. Moreover, when you have this, you might try to deform it. You may try to see how the action could be modified in order to preserve this structure, namely, such that this thing would still satisfy BV. So you need to change S, V, and pi simultaneously. And you can do it step by step. 
So I am interested, I'm interesting to see what is this pi in M theory, where by M theory I mean 11 dimensional supergravity. So what goes on there? I all, I'm also interested in to see how this structure comes out in n equals two super young bills with matter. And how it comes out in other theory. Okay. Or what is the meaning of this structure in n equals four two dimensional sigma models? So how to write the structure if you if we have hypercalab target? Okay. So there is a lot of questions just to work on. But I would like to explain how this thing naturally come in BV language. And the main idea is the following. Suppose you have standard supersymmetric realization of a symmetry. Sorry, standard realization of a symmetry. You are writing uh, BV action. Then what you can do with BV action? You can take a BV integral. So when you take BV integral, you get a new BV action. And uh, it may happen that in taking this integral, you will generate such terms and get uh, symmetry realized on shell. So let me consider the simplest possible example. That I know. And this example is as follows. Suppose you have a group SOD that acts on the space RD. Okay. In the standard way. And there is an invariant function. So what is the simplest invariant function? Simplest invariant function is x1 squared plus plus xd squared. So the, and here we can write down standard b action x1 squared squared plus xd squared plus what? Plus orthogonal rotation. So orthogonal rotation are generated by anti-symmetric matrices, right? So the vector fields are x star i, x j. Anti-symmetric. So here I just write C I G. So previously I wrote it in the following way. C A V A I. Yes. So maybe it's better to put I J here. And I put it in square bracket just to show that it is an analog of this index. So here are just anti-symmetric matrices whose elements are odd. Okay, nothing else. These things are nothing but the linear vector fields. 
xj over d xi minus xi over d xj. I anti-symmetrize because I anti-symmetrize here. So I need to write down sum over ij. Okay. And then there is a structure constant that is C star IJ C I one J one C I two J two and here is some structure constant. Of course, F I J I one J one I two J two. So in order to compute this thing, you need to commute corresponding matrices. And here we have some delta functions, but for me this is not important because what happens? This term would be the same. It would not be touched. What I will do then? I would like to integrate it over dx d. Okay. Here I have a Gaussian integral. Okay, I prefer to put here minus sign. I can take a Gaussian integral. Nothing wrong. So when I take this integral, this term would go away. And I'd like to see effective action. So I would get e to the minus x1 squared plus x d minus one squared plus Of course, I'll have this structure. But now let us see what happens with this term. Here I will have sum over i. Ah, of course, when I say I integrate over xd, since it's Lagrangian multiplier, I need to say that I put this equal to zero. I forgot to say it. So here I have a sum of a Cij. Ij going from one to d minus one. Xi star Xj. But there would be additional terms. If one of these guys is D, say J is D and I is not D. So this is a Gaussian integral. And I would get C I D C K D. X star I X star K A So what did do? So what did I got? Without any supersymmetry. Okay, I got here infinity or on cell realization of the symmetry. I got strange thing. Old vector fields 
or almost all vector fields. Vector fields that did not contain D are acting here. The vector field that contain D act by zero because we don't see them here. However, we see them here. There is a bivector for this element. And this element is, of course, the image of the external of the second external power of the Lie algebra. And what I have here is exactly this bivector. So, so this is the simplest way to see how SOD acts on RD minus one with the function What's this function? So this is very non-standard from the point of view of original representation theory. Because some, because it's not only the Lie algebra that is acting, but also in some sense, uh, it's external square that is acting. Formula is written here. You may rephrase this in writing down that the L infinity action is a map. the external power of the Lie algebra to the poly vector on X. Such that lambda zero of G, as you know, it is a, a point or a field goes to S of X. Lambda one of G, that is G itself, goes to the vector fields on X. And lambda two of G goes to the by vectors what what, what kind of what kind of map linear map linear map okay let, let's say the map to the vector fields um vector fields on x so x here so is what b a i of x what does it mean for each element of the algebra, you have a vector. Sure, sure. Well, here, what's x? Some manifold. Well, okay, in our example, after you integrated out d. After I integrated out d, it will be r d minus 1. Okay, but you don't... And have... s of x would be this. Uh... I, I integrated XD out. So it's yeah, good so. that you are asking questions. People never considered such thing. So how how does this map from G to vec, vec X work in the okay. RD minus one case? This R. 
So there are different uh, there are different elements. There are elements that rotate R D. Here it goes to ordinal orthogonal trans uh, transformations in R D minus one. However, there are elements that were rotating. The vector. So if I if I write a vector like this, that we're taking this vector to some vector like this, or if I write it down geometrically, here there is r the r d minus one. Here is the d line. So if you rotate here, everything is standard. However, you have this type of rotation. So you take the, this line to Rd minus one. And of course, you also take this line to the vertical line, okay? So I will depict it maybe in this picture. So here is this line and here is I slide. So what is rotation? Like this. So for any I and D, there is such a rotation. Okay. So as you know, in order to determine rotation, in uh, Rd, you need you need to take d minus two plane, right? Mm -hmm. So in particular, for d equals two, this plane is just a point, and you rotate around this point. If d equals three, this plane is just a line, and you rotate around this line. So in higher dimensions, in higher dimensions, you rotate around the plane. Maybe it will be more transparent if I take example. Sorry, uh, I, are, you, are you still answering my question or is Yes, I'm still answering your question. So your question was, what is this map, right? Yeah, like what this this particular rotation that mixes I and D. These How... particular rotation are mapped to zero. Exactly. You see, but before, uh, so in order to answer this your map, I need to decompose Lie algebra as a sum of rotations that rotate D minus one in this plane and rotations like this. I was just explaining this decomposition. Mm -hmm. So it's not a morphism uh, as of the algebras, but rather a morphism of L infinity algebras or something like that? Yes. Okay. So this is a morphism of L infinity algebras. And moreover, it is important to include here lambda lot of G. You should not forget this. Uh, it is counterintuitive because the people used to think that symmetry, that symmetry are separate and uh, what is invariant is separate. It is a standard idea of invariant series. theory. You have a symmetry acting on some space and then you are looking for invariant. So you have typically you have a action of the group. There is also the action of the algebra. So this is deep inside our heads. So BV formalism. And this example suggests something new. Zero's component goes to S. First component goes to vector fields. And second component goes to bivector. And consistency condition is that you have the right hand side 
very special. That is the Poisson map between bivector and S. So symmetric system with the symmetry form, form a union. And this is absolutely counterintuitive from the point of view how we used to think about symmetry. So this infinity symmetry is this. So you may guess it because on the right hand side, you see derivative of S. So what people think when vector fields commute to something proportional to derivative of S, it means that uh, that it's, it's not a representation, it involves what is invariant. However, people uh, thought that they are safe saying, ah, oh, these are just proportional to equations of motion. However, this construction says that's not just proportional to equation of motion. There is a very special bivector. And the map is this. So people have to change their mind about what is so-called on-shell action of the symmetry. It is this. Moreover, so when symmetry, when theory is supersymmetric, uh, sorry. people, uh, people uh, like to write down some identities. That from the point of view, the theory is uh, supersymmetric, some uh, diagrams go to zero or something like this, okay? Then this notion in some sense refines what does it mean to be a symmetric on shell? And I expect that there are some new type of word identities, maybe for five on diagrams, that could be made out of this realization. However, I predict this type of word identities, but I never got them. So I am very interested to find this new word identities. And uh, if you do this in uh, say super, uh, super symmetric theories, you can prove something on perturbative level. And then if you have kind of regularization of anything, you need to see if this regularization preserves this infinity symmetry. So nobody checked this. So it's absolutely open question, and once again, in applications to supersymmetric theories, okay? So we should have breaks, right? So I was talking for 45 minutes, and now we have a five minute break, right? Okay. So here is a logical point. And then I'll consider more examples. I mean, okay. I, I would like to. Uh... So, okay, uh, questions are more important than break. Uh, so, how to so how to connect this example to supersymmetry? Mm. Ah. So I'll explain it after the break. So here, so here there is no supersymmetry. Okay, all right. So I'll try to explain how to connect this to supersymmetry. Okay. I mean, well, um, like you probably consider more, you could probably consider super space instead of space and super algebra instead of algebra, right? right? Yeah, so, uh, but, but this generalization is, is clear. Ah, maybe you guess how to do it. So you may think, what is the analog of this X, XD integral in supersymmetric theory? Okay. So of course it has an error. So what is the quadratic integral that you are taking in supersymmetric theories? Well, Do you know? Auxiliary field, yeah. Exactly. 
So it happens when you integrate out auxiliary fields. Mm -hmm. Moreover, as you know, there could be different set of auxiliary fields to integrate out. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that describes the supersymmetric theory is the theory after integration of these auxiliary fields. So if you manage to study supergravities, just the simplest supergravity, n equals one in d equals four, people are saying there is this set of auxiliary fields or there is that set of auxiliary fields. There are several sets of auxiliary fields. However, supergravity super itself is something not containing auxiliary fields. It is described by an action with a vector field representing supersymmetry. And then if you think what is missing, the missing are these terms that would be by vectors. So there was a book called 1001 Lessons in Supersymmetry. So I claim that this is 1002nd lesson. I just want to add one more lesson, okay? Mm -hmm. So now I will make a, uh, a seven minutes break. Okay.
Okay, maybe I don't know how much time passed. Okay, two more minutes. Okay. Hello. Are you here? I'm me too. Kolya. So let me see. Ah, Kolya is not here yet. Okay. Саш, пока перерыв еще идет, можете задать какой-нибудь вопрос. Я думаю, хочу задать один, но не знаю, может, это покажет мои пробелы какого-то времени, но тем не менее попробую, что касается этого. И у меня есть насчет другого тоже вопроса. А здесь, например, если группа будет не S, SOD, а SU, это просто... Это будет в конце концов одно и то же. Почему мы берем SOD? Просто самый простой. Для SU то же самое можно сделать. То же самое, да? Окей, maybe since it's questions and uh, they are relevant, uh, you could, it's, it's, it will be better to ask it. Окей, okay. yes. So for SUD, here you start with C to the power D. And here we write Z1 moduli square. And everything would be the same. Mm -hmm. And you can also integrate. So actually, my claim is that this uh, leads to the new Are way you to... already? Kolya? Yes, well, you, did, you, did you tell something? Or... Ah, I'm answering the question, what happens if I have here SUD or even UD? Oh, there okay. is an action here. There is a quadratic form. 
and you can integrate. Moreover, as you know, for any simple algebra, the Cartan, there is a Cartan quadratic form and you can write it down. So you can always play this with a joint. So there is a Cartan quadratic form and you can always integrate something out of the Cartan. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I consider the action of the Lie algebra on itself. I can uh, go to infinity representation here. You see, since I'm not a mathematician, but mathematical physicist, I'm not interested in uh, doing examples for examples. I am interested in doing examples uh, where they fit my applications. That's why instead of uh, study the theory of infinity representations, I do the following. I am telling this to mathematicians and maybe somebody are interested in the new representation theory. Hmm? Maybe they are not interested. Okay. So I'm not going to do it by my own. I, since I don't think that the Lie algebra themselves is the most fundamental object in the world. So that's why right now I'll come to the more physical example. That mathematical physicist knows. You see, to make quadratic integrals, Gaussian integrals, it's easy, yes? And this example is, uh, of course, n equals to supersymmetric quantum mechanics, okay? So there are two fields, fields that are called chiral, phi that depends on T minus theta theta bar and theta. And there is another field phi bar that depends on, on tie plus theta theta bar and also theta bar. So maybe I make a mistake, but I remember it in this way. So uh, how many thetas should I keep? Should I keep? So actually, so would it work this way? Maybe I have to put here pluses. So I, I, I'll uh, change it. So something like this, or maybe minus. Okay, let me try to recall. And here there are, there are additional things. So uh, actually I'm trying to mimic the story when you have Z chiral. Yeah, but this will give you n equals four, what's called n equals four quantum mechanics, if you have four theta. No, it will be n equals two. N equals two, at least in the standard terminology, it only has two thetas, quantum mechanics. You see, since, uh, since it should be a reduction, uh, okay. Yes, you are right. 
in the quantum mechanical sense, it's n equals four. So oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now let me let me recall the thetas that you have here. So I'll try to sum thetas. So as far as I remember, you have four thetas here. So so some some would be with a bar. And some would be called plus and minus. So I remember it in this form. So like this. So there are theta pluses. These came out of Z. And there, there should be theta minuses. So if I'll make it wrong, I'll uh, correct myself. Okay. Maybe with your help. So here I have complex conjugation. And I think I have here theta minus. So there is a kinetic term. A kinetic term is D for theta. So I have theta plus, theta minus, and the same with bars. And here I put Phi T ah, first I need to you see I wrote it, but I have to decompose it. Maybe I need to put here theta minus and here theta plus. Well, if if you're thinking of a standard chiral superfield, then it has both theta plus and theta minus. Ah, yes. So here here it should have like this, yes. And here you should have with the bars, I think. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, this way. Then, then I decompose this field. It is phi. Of T minus T theta plus theta plus bar. Plus some fermion psi over t minus theta plus theta plus bar. Maybe I will not even write it. I'll call this theta plus, t plus. Psi t plus times theta plus plus psi T plus theta minus. So these are different fields. Maybe I call here plus and minus. And there would be also F field. F of T plus theta plus theta minus. I think I got it right. The same happens here, where everything is complex conjugated. The, the the shift of t is probably off, but if if it's not important, why it's odd? Well, I mean off. No, um, don't you want the, the up the first and second line to roughly be complex conjugate to each other? Yes. Uh, let me see. Yes, I want them to be complex conjugate to each other. So, but, but but maybe then I put it this way. Of course, I want them to be complex conjugate. So so it's a question. Question: What? You, So 
sorry, can I ask also maybe trivial question? But, but anyway, if I understand uh, right, n is a dimension, yes? Uh, no, this is not dimension. This is uh, this is a number of supersymmetries. Ah, symmetries. Okay. So, uh, so here, the supersymmetries are d over d theta minus d over d theta plus. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, you see, I, I count, kind of forgot a bit this example. You see, I am mixing up theta pluses and theta minuses here. But uh, I am pretty sure that uh, one can work out this example. So actually, here you have integral of a d4 theta phi phi bar and when you try to get all all thetas out you want to to take derivatives so of uh, phi so so I, i'm trying to recall how to get it so from phi, I'm taking plus and maybe minus, and from uh, phi bar, I'm taking minus and plus. Okay. So it's the first thing. So I call the superfield. And uh, there is also a term that is called integral over d to theta. And here we integral over dt. And here we are integrated over dt plus. Or d, dt, I call it plus. Oh, with minus, okay. So here we integrate over dt plus. d to theta. And what you put here, it's called superpotential. It's a function function of phi. And you have a complex conjugated thing. W bar of phi bar. So when you expand it, when you expand it, you get the following structure. In order to get four thetas, you can take second derivative. So first derivative of phi and first derivative of phi bar. By the way, uh, I think I, I looked it up. I think it's uh, t plus theta plus theta plus bar plus theta minus theta minus bar. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, the the here it's still theta plus. Just the shift. It's not just theta plus theta plus bar. It's theta plus theta plus bar plus theta minus theta minus bar. I think. Ah, it's because that was for Z and this is for T. I think you are right because it's sigma three that stands here. Okay, so here I have minus theta plus that applies bar my okay. Maybe you are right. Uh, I, I meant in the first, I mean, of course, it depends on your conventions, but. but... Uh, in the first one, I meant both with plus, and then in the second one would be both with minus. I mean, it's just if you take the conventions for, for two dimensions from 
Yes. Same here. Same I, I think you are right. Here is minus. Okay, let, let us do it this way. So if you do it this way, so if you do it this way, yes, thank you. And actually you can consider, okay, you can consider a function k that depends on phi and phi bar, and it will give a more general structure. But I consider this the simplest one in order not to write down some extra derivatives, phi and phi bar. So I expand, I have integral over d for theta. So how can I get the, how can I get it? I can get it from time derivatives. So it will be phi, phi dot. I can also get, I can also get theta plus out of phi and uh, so if I take plus here and uh, and this plus, then I get derivatives of Then I'll get here something like psi psi, one derivative here, all right? So from this psi bar, I get theta bar plus, from here, I get theta plus, and from derivative in T, I get this theta minus theta minus term. So actually, I'll get here structures like this. And uh, so one with plus and one with minus, I think, or both with, I think both with plus. And that's it. No, that's not it. It's not that it, that's it because I have this term and this term, and I have term without derivatives, f of bar. Yes, I shouldn't forget it. Then I have uh, terms. So this is called kinetic term. So it is called it is called d term. I also have terms coming from superpotential. From superpotential. So here I take W of phi. And I integrate over d theta minus d theta plus and integral d t plus. So here I have what? I have the Just first dt. derivative. Just dt, no plus. What? You see, this depends on t plus. You already integrate over theta plus theta minus, so just integral of dt. Okay. Maybe not okay. I I remember it was dc d, d, dt plus, and you conjugate the quantum, and then you then you then you change one thing in, into another thing. So I mean, when you do this, you replace this argument by t. So when I take dt t plus, I uh, replace dt plus of, of phi of t plus 
by phi of t dt. So I still think it's dt class. I, well, you think it's dt? I mean, how would you... How do we integrate? I mean, it's, uh, well. So I thought that integral over dt plus phi of t plus in particular is integral over dt phi of t if I make this coordinate change. Well, um... I mean, certainly in the super space, you have just integral dt, d theta, but oh, wait, maybe I'm, let me see. Let me see. Mm. Uh, after you integrate it over theta plus and theta minus, you don't have thetas anymore, so. Okay. Because uh, the question is what to do with the extra, th extra thetas, okay. Maybe you are right and I, so if it's the same, so let's be the same. So basically what I have here is W prime of phi and here I have F. So F gives both thetas. And there is also term W two prime and I get here psi plus psi minus. And I and I also have complex conjugated term. W bar phi of phi bar. And here I have F bar plus W bar psi plus bar psi minus bar. Okay. So here I have this F's. Here I have this F of bar. Now, let us see how supersymmetry acts. Okay. So there is an action of supersymmetry that involves F, right? So uh, in order to see what happens, let me just predict that for me, I would be interested so I can see what's going on even of the level, even at the level of uh, constant mode of zero mode. If you add the time dependence, nothing will change. So at this level, there is a supersymmetry that acts as follows. It takes what? It takes F into so there is one supersymmetry that takes F into psi plus. There is a supersymmetry that takes F into psi minus. So let me see how it goes. So when I can, when I take this supersymmetry, when I shift theta, I replace it by epsilon. No, it is psi that goes into F. So, so supersymmetry actually, actually takes psi into F. Yes. So, so how do I write it in terms of fields? I can write it in the following way. Supersymmetry would be called psi star 
and here I'll get F. And here there will be some pluses or minuses. Epsilon plus psi minus star going into F. And similar things would be for complex conjugated things. So epsilon bar minus psi bar star minus going to F bar plus epsilon bar plus. You see, I sorry, I will have here minus going to F bar. Here I'll have this FM bar term. Okay, that's what I like. And you see, uh, this what, is it? what did you just write? So I wrote it for constant modes. Wrote what? Supersymmetry. So these epsilons are ghosts of supersymmetry. Uh, sorry, can can you write the equality sign? S B V equals oh, okay. S on constant modes. So SBV depends on what? SBV depends on fields that are F, F bar. And you see this size, plus minus. And also on epsilon, epsilon bar plus minus. So it's reduction to zero mode. And this formula. Sorry, uh, I'm. Um, uh, first of all, I don't see uh, psi plus minus. And uh, wait, uh, okay. What what is star? Is it anti field or? Ah, so so uh, uh, of course, of course. Here, yes, it's an anti uh, anti field, and of course. I forgot to write so W term. This is correct. I forgot to put these terms. Oh, and, and, and what about? Um... On constant modes. And phi? What happened to phi? Ah. You are right. So it was, so we, so, uh, so actually I, I forgot to, to write down phi. Uh, so, so uh, here psi goes to f of shell, and there would be also phi. So psi plus goes to f bar, and uh, okay. Uh, so I I started from okay, and phi. And phi goes to psi. By the way, phi goes, so if psi plus goes to f bar, then phi bar goes to psi bar minus. And here is epsilon plus. To the bar.
And I think somewhere here there was a minus sign. First of all, I forgot here to start. So I thought that this is this transformation. Psi goes to F, Psi plus goes to F, and uh, Psi. Oh, I, I already wrote it. So so here I wrote that psi goes to psi plus goes to f to f bar with the epsilon minus. Psi minus goes to f bar with the epsilon plus. So I got this correct. Now phi, phi bar. Phi, ga, phi bar goes to with the epsilon minus once again. I'm writing here. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'll try to get it right. Phi bar goes to psi minus with the epsilon plus. So oh, you see, and now, now I need to find out pluses and minuses here because, of course, I remember that uh, if I take one transformation transformation twice, I should get zero. So once again, I'm trying to get the spins right. So this term takes psi plus bar to f bar. Okay. This term takes so we are at maybe to psi minus. How, how, how do I get the signs properly? So, um, mm -hmm. so this should take phi, maybe a psi plus. No, it, it's not this way. One should take it to psi minus. It's uh, so psi. Ah, it, it, it's it's not like this. Too many terms. So psi plus goes to a bar with. Epsilon minus. And uh, with the epsilon, and with the when I have epsilon plus, it takes phi bar So there is plus and minus. And they are acting in differently here. While minus takes this way, plus takes another way. So how do we get it? Once again, here we have phi plus theta minus psi plus plus theta plus psi minus plus theta plus theta minus f okay so d over d theta minus what does it do it takes psi into phi and it takes f into psi minus right So in, in the action, I think it should be uh, epsilon bar plus psi plus f bar. The first, the first term should have epsilon plus. The second term should have uh, psi, 
epsilon minus epsilon bar minus second term uh, horizontally yeah and then um in the second line just change uh second in the second term in the second line change epsilon uh, no 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 psi to plus psi bar plus in the, la the last no 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 not this one not this one in the last term psi bar plus uh, how about now uh, i think it will work so let us see you see okay so you see here pluses or minuses are not that important ah no they are important they are important you see so the only thing that i care about is this f bar term okay so i'm looking at f uh, f bar terms f terms and f of bar and all and also here so So this is uh, the standard thing where you have on, on zero modes. Here you have invariant, here you have invariant function. And here is the supersymmetry that is like, like rotation with four parameters, epsilon plus, epsilon minus, I think, Yes, I think you are right. So phi goes to psi minus, and that's it with epsilon plus, and psi plus, psi plus goes to f, yes. So this is okay. And uh, here, yes. And here with the epsilon minus, psi goes to f bar. while uh, phi goes to psi plus, yes, okay. Okay, so here I have four terms and I have two more terms here. Complex conjugated with epsilon. So here we say minus and here we say plus. Okay, so all these terms. Now, now I need to integrate f out. So when I integrate f out, I'll get the following structure. W prime phi plus you see here I have epsilon plus bar plus star, right? And uh, so it's uh, epsilon psi with plus epsilon minus psi minus. And the same thing complex conjugate. So this is the result of this integration. And I still keep this W prime psi plus psi minus and also W bar prop two prime psi plus bar prime psi minus bar. Ah, so that's how it goes. plus epsilon minus psi minus. Okay. Now, and of course, yes, it's because it's only psi's that go to F. So no phi's here. So I have this at the very end. So when I take this square, I get the finally I get, I'm getting this by vector. And by vector is a term that is quadratic in epsilon. So 
So by vector is epsilon plus bar epsilon plus psi plus star bar psi plus. Oh, here is this by vector. And there are four other terms. And if you add the space time derivative, uh, they would not change. So this by vector does not contain uh, space time derivatives, as far as I remember. So this is how by vector looks like. So it contains two epsilons. It contains uh, two psi, psi bars, two psi stars. So, in some sense, the by vector is some constant depending on uh, epsilon. So, it depends on plus minus with the bars and uh, plus minus here. It's a constant. Okay, constant by vector is, is also a by vector. And that's how it looks like. But of course, it produces a non-trivial term when you when you are computing something. Because when you are computing something, you need to do what? You need to you have an extra term when you make a Poisson pairing <coughs> between this by vector and the function. So actually, you have here a vector field that has uh, psi bar and psi and w to prime. So it is there already. You see, from my experience, these by vectors are in supersymmetric theories that I observed. All these by vectors are constants. You see, despite I'm, I'm mixing these pluses and minuses, by vectors are like this. And maybe from the Lorentz point of view, there are minuses here, not for pluses. But still, there are these constants. And you can work it out. Moreover, as you see, by vectors do not depend on W. However, of course, these by vectors depend on the coupling constant that you may put here. So, as always, in Gaussian integral, by vector is like g naught squared times this. Okay, so this is by vector in uh, this type of supersymmetry. So it is n equals to four supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Maybe I should I should consider n equals to two, and then example would be would be simpler. But it is like this. Now, yeah, it would be half of the, like. Half of terms, yes. Half By half vector would, would still be persistent, mm -hmm. but uh, okay. This is the this is the supersymmetry that we. This is the maximal supersymmetry, n equals four quantum mechanics that we know in the normal superfields. So n equals eight supersymmetric quantum mechanics we don't know in normal superfields.
So for n equals eight, we need to say that I think that each epsilon has additional symbol like one and two. And it would be interesting. Ah, by the way, there will be no superpotential, but who cares about superpotentials? You will still get something like this. I guess you can just guess it. Okay. However, for n equals eight super symmetric quantum mechanics, you do not have uh, what? You do not have super potential. Okay. Oh, we do. No, we don't. But still, we have a metric here. So if we study a metric and kinetic term, I think that this may result to some constraint. So you see, I never did it. I never studied this structure in n equals eight. Well, in n equals eight, you don't have enough auxiliary shields to close yes. of, sh of shells. Yes. So yes, but but uh, I could try to work it out from the potentially. I could try to work it out from the action. Because I have closure. Since I have closure only on shell. Yes, yes. Yeah. I might try to look if mm -hmm. there is such a term or not. Yeah, so each epsilon will have additional SU2 index. Yes. And you, I guess you can track them and what? And then this thing would be involved in somehow in uh, determining the, the kinetic term, namely the metric. Because here, here, what stands here is the metric. And, and uh, actually here, there is a metric and this metric should be second derivative. D to G over D phi, okay, scalar potential. We know that this that it's scalar potential that stands here. And it means somehow that scalar potential uh, is involved. So scalar potential stands here. And when you integrate, you have here something like inverse scalar potential. So you see, it looks that this by vector depends on Keller potential. Then you may ask, what could be a Keller potential if you have uh, more fields? Because in this case, this Keller potential would determine hyperkeller metric. And you may study it by trying to guess this structure. Or you may put it another way. So I don't actually know what is the proper way to do how to treat it properly, but but it is the structure. So what I'm telling you that it is the structure that you need to study. And it would be interesting to find in this way the condition that you have uh, hyperkeller metric. Yeah, but it's not inverted, by the way. It's just just the Keller metric there. Just the Keller metric. Yeah, because uh, yes, you see, I am making too many mistakes today. Right. So in this sense, you may say that 
the bivector has what does it mean? It has a potential. So uh, I don't know how to go further. However, I am interested. Mm -hmm. Sorry, actually, just maybe I was wrong. Just a double check. The no, you are right. We, we need to contract this psi bar on psi with some derivatives. Yeah, but this is psi star. Is it? Does it trans? Is it valued in the same bundle bundle as psi, or in the dual one? In, uh, in the dual, psi star is valued. Ah, right. So, okay, Kolya, you are right. You are right. Once again, minus one. So in the in the action. Yeah. Oh, it's it, of course it's in the dual because it's anti field. Anti field uh, are in the dual space. Okay. And without having this, we cannot just make quadratic integral over f. And as you know, there'll be some other terms like derivatives of scalar potential here. Okay. And the first uh, four and the first eight terms in the action don't have wait, they don't have scalar potential. The F terms, of course, they don't have scalar potential. The, no, the, the 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 first the terms that involve anti fields. Of course not. Because they come from uh, from the action of the on the on the superfields, mm -hmm. so this is just vector field on superfields. It has nothing to do with scalar potential. Only here we have scalar potential. So it's it's uh, from kinetic term. These are the same. Then you have this term. And uh, ah, so and you dropped all the terms with oh, it's a zero zero modes only. Okay. Yes. Because what we really would like to get is the Keller potential on fields phi, not phi phi bar. But feel phi bar, phi one, and phi two, right? And we don't know how to determine it. By the way, you say that you know how to de determine it. It should be a Keller potential of the very special form called the special geometry, right? Sorry, in what case? What? So here I'm writing down n equals eight supersymmetric quantum. Ah, okay, sure. So n equals eight supersymmetric quantum mechanics comes from n equals two. You may see from n equals two uh, Maxwell theorem because here we have scalars. And you have special geometry on this scale. So it means that Keller potential is not an arbitrary function. It's kind of a special function. So what I'm writing here, I'm doing the following thing. I am taking them Maxwell theory in dimension n equals two, of course, d equals four. And I am doing dimensional reduction to dimension one. Moreover, since I am going to 
constant modes, I am going to dimension zero. Okay. So all fields would be kind of a scalar. And the question is, what would be this term? So in this way, you should be able to reproduce the special geometry that, that says that written in terms of phi one, phi two, it's a very special uh, potential. So I never did it, but you see how it could go out. So here you're just guessing the structure. So you need to guess simultaneously the by vector and the what and the rest. By the, by the way, I don't know how to do it. I never checked. But if you study this zero mode theory, you might guess that if you put here an arbitrary function of phi and phi bar, it would not be consistent. So the outcome, there is a by vector. And knowing this by vector, you should be able to reproduce everything. Or, or you may study deformation theory using these by vectors without knowing the superfields. So you see, I haven't studied this structure. I'm just showing how the structure appears. And how are you going to study the formations? Mm -hmm. So I will study the formation. I will study the theory. I will study representation for the K equals constant. Here I know something. Then I would like to preserve. I would say k goes to k plus delta k. And I'll uh, try to write down this equation. Maybe it would be consistency condition between the by vector. And you see, when I am integrating fields out, I, I think I also have, so I think I missed something. Okay. So, or not. So I never did it, actually. But I know that there is such a structure. You missing, what are you missing? So I'm, I'm trying to see if I missed anything. No, F always contains just fermions. So by vector is like this. So vectors are the, are, are the same. So here I see vectors. So I have this by vector 
and still I have these vectors. So there are consistency conditions. So when I will, so when I will try to write down this consistency condition, I will have a Poisson bracket between vector and by vector, okay? And it would be an equation. Well, well, what consistency condition and what equation? What do you mean? Okay. So if I forget some details here, and I with these pluses and minuses, I will write the general structure like this: epsilon, epsilon, psi plus, psi. Okay. And here I will also have something like epsilon phi bar star psi structures like this and structures like this. So F is already integrated out. So these are the only vectors that are left. No, there are also these vectors. Plus some terms like epsilon No, only only phi goes to psi, right? And also phi goes to some other psi. So let us see where do we have here consistency condition. When I'll take the when I'll take the equation, I will have to act by these vectors on this by vector and I'll have some contribution. They'll be pairing like this and they'll be also pairing like this. Okay. So let me forget about bars. Maybe it's good that I try to work out the maximum case because in this case k is restricted. So the structure is some epsilons, psi stars, and here is some unknown function. Okay, unknown function. I don't that, that I don't know yet. I'll try to figure it out. I will call it G phi phi bar. Okay. So since it's not a metric, it's kind of by vector. So these psi's have lower indices. So here I'll write a by vector. Okay. And then I will have terms like like this with some epsilon. Okay, and then I'll have the following consistency condition. The Poisson bracket between this vector field and this by vector field should be zero if I take into account this epsilon. This would be epsilon cube term. So this would be, this looks like some kind of differential equation. So it looks like D G term. And there is also this term. Ah, you cannot cancel them out. 
because D G term contains psi bar psi bar star. Psi bar star psi. Bar. And there is another term. When you contract this with this, and here you'll get something like G psi stars pi bar star. And these two things, these two terms could not cancel each other. So I assume that if you group terms in front of this psi star or psi by star, you will find some equation on inverse metric. And also, if you consider Poisson equation here, you will find some equation on, uh, no, if you do Poisson, uh, you will get no equation because uh, you, you don't differentiate phi. You see something like this, only this. And uh, okay, I, actually, I don't know, is it possible to find n equals a structure here? So you would try, you might try to write thing. But I, at the moment, I don't know what, what the equations are and how they lead to hyperhelion metric. So just I don't know. But I know that there are such some consistency equations. You see, here I didn't even mention to say that I can solve something here. I just wanted to show that there is such a structure. So what, what can what can you do when you have such a structure? Like what what's what's it good for? So uh, I actually think that I conjecture that having such structures, you can try to find uh, how to go to, to n equals a. Because you know that to be, to be a hyperkeller, the scalar potential has to be of the very specific form. And I hope, I don't know, maybe you can get out this equation for hyperkeller potential this way. Moreover, as far as I understand, if you make dimensional reduction of n equals eight theory, super young mills with non-abelian group, you would have some very special potential. But, but and when you have this special potential, uh, you need to find out some relations how this potential is related to Keller potential. But yeah, you can write Keller potential in terms of prepotential. There are some expressions, but like right, and that's probably what you're gonna find here. What, what are you going to find here? Yes, yes. So uh, this approach says you study only zero modes, no operators, and uh, you can reproduce all structures. Yeah, um, and then I'm asking more like, and then if you can find something like, apply it to find something new this way. Yes, I I hope to. So uh, so I would like to see not I would like to get not only structure of the action. I would like to say that this structure of the action implies some structures on Feynman diagrams. Because when you study Feynman diagrams, you are of course off shell, okay? So you need, so I hope to get some kind of word identities 
for Feynman diagrams from this approach. You see, in this approach, I get more information. And this extra information is contained in this by vector. And I actually would like to get some, some kind of word identity. And these word identities would be of the new type. Because they would relate symmetry and the interaction. OK? Together. So this is kind of a novel approach to supersymmetry. So after I eliminated superfields and, and extra terms, I am getting the structure only on the fields. But it still knows. Uh, the symmetry. Unfortunately, I don't know how to write down proper word identities. Maybe I have not thought enough. So I am interested. And especially, I am interested in, the, in this. So what I definitely know, besides this theory with how many supercharges, with uh, so here I had four. Still, I strongly assume that uh, I have to double the structure for eight supercharges, and of course. There will be a by vector. So if you have by vector where we have low number of supercharges, where you get higher, you of, co of course you will have this by vector. And you can try to guess the structure of this by vector. And uh, what I know is that when I go to 16, I also have this type of bivector. And I got this bivector using pure spinner approach. And there are formulas for for n equals one, d equals ten. So here we have like 16, yes, supercharges. And when you go down, you'll get n equals 4, d equals 4. Still 16 supercharges. Then you can go down, and then you can get n equals 8, d equals 2. So. Here, here, I already have super potential, by the way. Of course, you know that if, if I go down, I, I have super potential that comes from the young mills. So this goes down to, okay, to potential. And it's a thing to see that this potential is the only potential that is compatible with these by vectors. So this is a way to write down the supersymmetry without uh, kinetic terms. No field equation. So it would be just kind of classification of higher supersymmetric series. So suppose we write this BV action for uh, 4dn equals 4 with this by vector. So what can we apply it to? Yes, of course, but you need to know this by vector. 
I know this by vector here. So that's why I know this by vector here. Because I computed this by vector using pure spinners in my uh, paper with Lysov and I think Alexander and Krot. Okay, so so suppose you found this, you reduce this to four dimensions or you stay in 10, uh, let's do four dimensions. Um, I close yeah, so what can we get out of it? Is it does it make it easier to study uh, various uh, I don't know high derivative deformations of the theory that preserves supersymmetry, for example, or something? I would say maybe because here I have everything. Here I have the algebra. And it's explicit for. So if I go to n equals eight, d equals two, I will have this type of potential. Okay. Then, as you say, you may think that in effective theory, I will have f mu nu squared plus what? F mu nu to the fourth with some contractions. Okay. Then it is a deformation of the potential. Then we may study if this term is allowed. It. So what you say about high derivative, you look at high derivative, but I look at potential. And uh, if such term is excluded by this supersymmetry, I would say that it is not generated, that this term is protected. Or maybe this term is allowed. So how do I know? By study supersymmetry. In its infinity realization. And since I know, since I know that there are there is a super there are superfields here at this level through pure spinners, I know that there is at least one realization of supersymmetry here. So I know that there is a bivector. But idea is to study just this by vector. We also wrote another paper. I think I wrote it. So maybe in the same combination. When we found where we found the following thing, we found the n equals one, d equals ten theory with a smaller number of auxiliary fields, but with a strange deformation by super ghosts. You see, these guys are super ghosts, and this term is linear in epsilon. We found the realization of supersymmetry that is non linear in epsilon. However, it was, it is of, it is of the first order. So there was structure something cubic upstairs, something of, of uh, something quadratic downstairs. So we, we found structure that symbolically looked like this. By the way, this thing downstairs was something like pure spinner equations. And I, I don't remember what we had upstairs right now. And there are also auxiliary fields uh, with a fi finite number of auxiliary fields. And when we integrated these auxiliary fields out, we of course got the same by vector. So it means that uh, there are many ways to get by vector. These different ways to get by vectors uh, 
are not the, are not the part of the theory. You may consider them as a tools to get by vector, but by vector itself is uh, is a necessary piece of description of the supersymmetry. So this is this crazy story about bivectors. So if somebody would be interested, we can discuss it. How to use this bivectors and getting higher supersymmetry deformations. Moreover, I'd like to try to apply the same thing, the same thing to supergravity. Because what I expect, I expect that in this case, these epsilons would not be constants. They would be kind of fields, but structure should be at least like this. So you know that when I compactify supergravity on some manifold, I get not only supergravity, but I have supergravity together with uh, Supersymmetric theorem. And of course, I expect that these constant epsilons would come out of the dynamical epsilons. So constant epsilons in supergravity compactification would be covalently constant spinners. Because you know, if you have a flat metric, you have covariantly constant spinners. If you have a Calabi Yau metric, you have a covariantly constant spinners. So the background somehow breaks the fields to, to the so called zero modes. And uh, I hope to get. Description of the higher supersymmetry in this way. That's why I actually believe that such structure is persistent to supergravity too. Let me say one more thing. It is kind of speculative, but there is possibly or probably a string theory derivation of this by vectors. Just imagine the four point function. Okay. So there are vertex operators. And uh, there are different type of vertex operators. There are vertex operators corresponding to matter fields and there are vertex operators corresponding to symmetry. Okay. So moreover in string theory, you have vertex operators corresponding to anti fields, as you know. So in the open string theory, What kind of uh, vertices do you have? You have a vertex that has no C. And this corresponds to the symmetry. And you have a vertex that contains C. And this corresponds to the matter field, like gauge field. You have a vertex that has CDC. And this corresponds to the anti field of matter. And finally, you have the vector field that corresponds to C, D, C, D to C. And this corresponds to, to anti fields of symmetry. 
So this is symmetry. So this is a symmetry stuff. So the idea is that amplitudes in string theory correspond not only to scattering amplitudes, but also to the but also to their symmetry. And let me see how I'm trying to interpret this term. I will try to interpret this term in the following way. I should have corresponding to anti fields. And these should have more C's than the original operator. And there should be also vertex operator corresponding to symmetries. Okay, so I call this a anti vertex operators. Sorry, what, what did you say have more C's? So there are four in, in the open string theory, there are four types of vertex operators. There is vertex operator, roughly speaking, fire vector. There is vertex operator, roughly speaking, AM of X DXM times C. So this corresponds to symmetries in bosonic string. This corresponds to fields. I call them A. There is another thing. CDC. This corresponds to to what? To anti fields. And there is also CDC D to C firewax. And this corresponds to symmetry anti fields. So people know that already in the open string theory you have this structure. Gauge field anti-field, symmetry, and uh, anti-field for symmetry. So what do you compute where you are computing amplitudes? You have some expression written in terms of A, okay? So that's what most people are computing. like four point amplitude. So it's a disk. So you have C, 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 C. You have four Cs, but you have B field somewhere here. So the total number is three. So this is the amplitude. Two gauge fields and two gauge fields, okay? But this is not the only thing that you can compute. You can also compute the following structure. Or try to compute. Where we have no C fields. Here. But you have C, the C field here. So this, here we have anti field, and here we have a symmetry. And you know, because you have C field here, C field here, and B field somewhere here. And you know that this contribution is zero, because somehow this B field commutes with this S, since it has no C, C part. So it means that symmetry is not corrected because of the amplitudes. However, the tree level correlated is non-zero. So here we have AC. Here we have AC D to C. So it's A star. And here we have a symmetry because no C. This three point amplitude is a number. 
And if to respond to the term, that is C A star A. And this is a symmetry. Actually, it's a gauge symmetry. Okay. So that's what's going on in the open string set. Now, let us consider this open string So you see, I'm trying to find this term here. So in order to find this term here, I will need to have two vertex operators inside the disk that would correspond to symmetry epsilon. And two vert vertex operators here. Ah, it's this diagram. That would correspond to to meta fields, twenty fields. So like CDC on the boundary, CDC on the boundary. So this is the disk and two vertex operators corresponding to the symmetry. So I want to say that this thing would come out of this diagram. So this with two points on the boundaries, two points inside, and you integrate over the modular space. So when you have super string theory, it is interesting to compute this amplitude. And computing this amplitude, you should get exactly this term. So it's kind of a prediction that these terms are coming out of string theory. Why are they in the bulk as epsilon? Because uh, these symmetries seem to belong to the background, to the gravity. Uh, so, okay, what, what kind of symmetry? Supersymmetry. Ah, supersymmetry. So there is a vertex okay. that's mm -hmm. to supersymmetry. Sure, sure. The string field, I mean, the spin field. Yeah, so it's kind of a spin field. And you compute two spin fields here, you compute these fields here, and you should get exactly this term. So that's why this structure is already inside string theory. Similarly, you see, you have this structure. Psi star field here, then like A, something like A here. And one super supersymmetry inside. If you compute this amplitude, you would compute just the action of supersymmetry on the field. You see, it's a structure of this type. Epsilon phi star psi. One should be an empty field, one should be a field, and this should correspond to a ghost. And moreover, condition that this is a proper vertex operator is exactly condition that this epsilon is a supersymmetry of the metric. So you should look for very special spin operators. So if you have a curved metric, you need to find if there is corresponding spin operator or not in the curved background. And then the action of this supersymmetry on the fields of the gauge sector should be like this. So 
So how do I know it? I know it because I know it in the field theory limit in the pure spinner theory. It's possible to compute it. So in pure spinner theory, inclusion of such operator deforms user B with T differential. And you can see the reaction. And the reaction is appearance of such type of diagrams. I would like to say that this structure was, was completely not studied. And then you may ask why I have only two fields here. Why, why I don't have more fields here. But when you were discussing how you have symmetries fields, anti-fields and goes in, uh, in terms of, okay, these four lines on the right. Was it taken from where, from like, uh, is it something known to string field theory people or it's- Some people, something... some people observed it. Some people observed that when you study string theory amplitude, you should not restrict yourself to the vertex operators that are linear in C. Yeah, but, but when people study string field theory, they also study it in BV language, right? So is yes. it- uh, Yes, is of it... course. So people who study string field theory, of course, know this. And you see that string fields come naturally in the BV language. So it's like DC that uh, moves you between them. Mm -hmm. You see the parity of this is opposite to the parity of this because of DC standing here. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, uh, and you say they don't know those people that study string field theory in BV language, they don't know. And people what? who study the string field theory, as far as I understand. So at least I haven't seen such papers. They haven't studied this type of structure. Mm -hmm. But would they study it, they would see some, I would call it amplitude, I don't know how to call it, containing two anti-fields and uh, two epsilons. And this theory and this structure is already there if you study supersymmetry in terms of auxiliary fields, but in super strings there are no auxiliary fields, or you can say that string itself is an auxiliary field. It depends how you think. So I have not computed this myself, honestly speaking, but that's what I expect that one can compute. At least it's a, it's a disk amplitude. The modular space is very standard. And then it will be possible, it should be possible to compute it on the curved background. By the way, it would be interesting to find uh, these BV equations as a consequence of the properties of this amplitude. You see, once again, this is the structure of the BV action. And the, if this is a symmetry of the BV action, you, you should have corresponding symmetry of the amplitude, okay? Because when you go to amplitudes, you go from fields to solutions to equations of, to linearized equations of motion. If you go there, you induce more structure. You are not losing structure. 
So if you go to constant modes, you see constant modes are always solutions to equations of motion. So uh, these structures are, of course, zero momenta amplitude. If you would like to consider it in the flat space. So once again, this is these are missing amplitudes in string theory. All right. We, by the way, we're getting close to three hours. Yes. So I have not explained how to get from you how to get super young mills from pure spinners. Okay, but I explained you the story about bivector to some extent. And so let me make a resume, okay? Uh, and here there is a problem, how to see a special geometry using bivectors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how to see this by vectors and string theory. Okay. I'll I'll make the resume here. First, in BV language, symmetry in general correspond to by vectors and maybe higher. And here I put a question mark because I don't know if there are higher things. Second, there are examples that I called finite dimension. And we somehow worked out examples to example to A. It was SOD action on RD minus one together with the function x1 square plus xd minus one square. And we also somehow worked out example to be that is supersymmetry for zero momenta. Acting on the Keller manifold. What we haven't done, we have not derived the Keller condition. But I hope it's possible to do this. And here there was a question to see in double question marks. It's how to work with. So it's symmetry with what? With how many charges? With eight. No, with four. The question is supersymmetry eight. How to derive hyperkeller or potentials? Okay. By the way, you know that in supersymmetry eight, there is so called uh, twisted superpotential. Okay. What I had not explained, not explained, but, this, but I can explain this. How to do 
where we have n equals 16 super young males, how to get, how to see by vector. And there is a conjecture. You can see by vectors in super string amplitudes. CDC A star. Um, yes. CDC A star. So here two, two guys of this type. So it is a conjecture because it has the proper structure. So this should be computed. A. So conjecture one. Compute in Neves Schwartz Ramon super string. Conjecture two. Compute. In pure spinner superstring. So when people study superstrings, they two superstrings, then they compare uh, the scattering amplitudes. However, it's, it's easier, maybe it's much more instructive to compare these things. And of course, the question how it goes to supergravity. So, in supergravity, you expect this epsilon to be a function of x. And you expect to get all these vertex operators. So, there are two supergravity. Supergravity in terms of pure spinners, and there is also supergravity in terms of fields, and there is also supergravity in terms of strings. Okay, so these things could be different, and that's called. And that's called said. It's interesting to see how super see how this constrain. F we knew to the force correction. And in gravity sector, R plus R square correction. What could we say about it from the existence of supersymmetry? Okay, so this is so this is actually what I know about by vectors. That's it. Okay, should I stop the recording? Yes. Okay. Yes.